If we can, I'd like to start off. We have a wonderful panel up here assembled, and we're also being graced this evening by um, a few young ladies that have come from different school systems. We have Danielle, uh, who is coming from Timberlane, okay, and that's middle school. We also have uh, Natalie, who's from the Hampstead Middle School, and then we have a high school student uh, who's coming to us from um, Sandown, and that's Leone. So I'm going to give you folks an opportunity, and I'm probably going to start, start off, if I could, with uh, Dr. Davey uh, from uh, Central Life Management. If you could just give us a, a couple of minute uh, feedback on what you see, some of the things that uh, you're experiencing, uh, and, and why you're really here today to, uh, to address us. And if we could use the mics. Hi, I'm Dr. Louise Morin Davy. I'm Director of Children's Services at Center for Life Management, which is the local mental health center for this particular region. We, uh, we deal with a lot of issues around bullying, um, both um, the victims and the perpetrators who um, do the, the bullying to the kids. Sometimes kids come in and we don't really know what's going on and, and we start uncovering issues as the clinical services progress um, and we're able to deal with that. We are also dealing with, fortunately we are um, a fully integrated um, electronic medical office basically. So we are able to access um, some of the websites that the kids are on and we do utilize those in our clinical sessions. We do have the kids show us their pictures and we say, hmm, Next time, that has to be off your website. Uh, and we do follow up with that. Uh, whenever we're capable of doing that, uh, we inform the parents. We try to work with the kids. Um, the girls do use a lot of provocative photographs on their websites. And it's really important for parents to be aware that that is out there and some of the language that is used um, and some of the activities that go on through um, um, that Facebook media or texting. Um, so I'm here because we work with kids day in and day out uh, addressing these uh, services, which really truly impact, emotionally impact the students uh, and the kids in our community. Thank you, Dr. Dan. Good evening. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here tonight. I'm Kathleen Murphy. I'm the director for the Division of Instruction at the New Hampshire Department of Education. And I'm here I'm wearing a number of hats. Uh, first, I've had a wonderful uh, years of experience working in the field as a classroom teacher, as a building principal, and as a superintendent of schools. And that's really given me a wonderful chance to really experience what life is in the field. And now at the department, I oversee the division of instruction, which includes um, safe, uh, safe schools. And that's our, our Title IV. Uh, grant that we receive from the federal government. Uh, in addition to my work at the department, we've also been, and folks at the department have been instrumental in supporting the legislation that is currently uh, in Concord, uh, being reviewed by the, our, our House and our uh, Senate, and hopefully soon, um, and uh, Representative Schlockman will share that with you, but soon uh, to pass um, a strengthened bullying bill. But our role at the department is really to support the schools and to support our professional staff. One of the major uh, responsibilities that we have at the department is to reach out into the schools and to support them through effective training, high quality training. And in this particular issue, uh, for the last year and a half, we have, as the department, sponsored a number of um, workshops for our professional staff as well as parents. We've opened the doors, we've invited parents to participate alongside um, the, the, the teachers and the leaders uh, from our systems um, and we've done that um, th uh, through summer training as well as training during the year. Uh, we've we, we currently have a, an initiative with the Attorney General's Office uh, looking at uh, the cyberbullying um, issue in schools. And um, we um, hope that um, <clears throat> with the passage of the new bill, we will continue our efforts around training. We will strengthen it because the bill is very specific. Uh, we must provide training within six months. Uh, of the passage of the bill, uh, followed by annual training of the staff, and I think that's critical. 
and it's critical for a lot of reasons. Um, you know, we have a very diverse population in our schools, and our youngsters need different types of um, uh, training based on all of their needs. Um, uh, youngsters need to be handled in certain ways. Our professional staff need to have those skills to be able to reach out for our students. And so over the, uh, over the course of time, we will be providing that kind of training. So it's really a, a, a good time uh, for us to really be active out in the communities. The other piece that's really important in this legislation, as well as the work that we do at the department, is around reporting. And our schools are expected to report bullying incidences. And, and some might dismiss that as not important. But that's critical in the work we do. Because with those reports from our school districts and, and school systems, we're able to identify and isolate where there may be problem areas. And from that point, then we can send in the appropriate technical assistance to help our school districts. So again, I mean, we're, we're, um, we're pleased at the work and pleased that we continue to create uh, safe learning environments for our kids. Thank you. Hi, I'm Donna Schlackman and I'm from Exeter and I am here because of people like yourselves. Um, I'm here because parents came to me about a year ago to tell me that the law that we had in our state, the Pupil Safety and Violence Protection Law, was not working for their children. And um, I really knew nothing about this law. I'm on the Commerce and Consumer Affairs Committee, but as a legislator, I'm responsible for setting policy for the state. And I sat and listened to these parents and their stories, and they had a copy of our current law. And then they showed me copies of laws from other states. And I went, wow. There's not much in our law. And sometimes that happens. Legislation starts out with a lot in it, and by the time it gets through all the committee process mm -hmm. and stuff, there's not enough in it. And there was, um, fortunately, this woman sitting to my left is in her position and um, has worked very, very hard with the parents that came to me and other people to craft the law. I don't know how many people have actually seen it or have a copy of it. Well, I, there are some copies here. I hope that you'll take it home with you. Um, over the, th this past year, I've had the opportunity and the pleasure to work with not only Kathleen Murphy from the Department of Education, but parents and people from, who are guidance counselors and principals and superintendents and child advocacy experts and the University of New Hampshire and on and on and on, crafting the legislation that some of you have seen and really, as Kathleen said, putting a lot into it. The legislation is really about providing a framework and a foundation for schools to build policies and expand upon the work that they're already doing. There are a lot of schools that are very concerned in doing really good things around bullying and cyberbullying, but um, we worked really hard to give a much more solid framework so that those schools who really weren't doing enough um, would have the meat and potatoes of what they needed for doing a good policy. Um, Cyberbullying is in the law. It, it, we didn't need it when the when our first was that our first law in 2004. We didn't need uh, cyberbullying. Who who? What was that? So we worked really hard to give schools the um, the authority to actually address cyberbullying because we we were hearing from police departments is that parents would come to them and say, "My kid's being cyberbullied, and it's affecting them in school," but they. There wasn't a law that was necessarily being broken. It hadn't ris risen to that level, but it was impacting the child's ability to feel safe and secure in school. And that's really our jobs. You know, it, when we send our kids off to school, we want to make sure that they not only are in a safe environment, but they trust that that environment can protect them and will protect them if something's going on in terms of peer bullying or cyberbullying. And so we worked really hard with the Department of Education to look at, you know, how, how can we work out processes that kids are protected, that they know who to go to, that they are protected from retaliation if they tell, because one of the things we were hearing is that kids are apt to stay home from school rather than, than go to school and not feel there's anybody that they can tell that they're having issues with. So if you read the bill, it's got a lot of detail in about What's, what needs to happen in the school. And the other thing we heard from parents is they didn't want to be left out of the process. They wanted to know all along the way, 
as soon as the report was made, that it was made, that their kids were protected, and, and that an investigation was going to be launched, and they wanted to know the timeline of the investigation, when, the, when they would be told what was going on, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I, I sit here before you on this panel because parents wanted something better for their children, and, and we as state employees and state legislators are responsible for making sure that um, the kids are safe, and, and so that's, that's my little piece of this Thank discussion. you, Representative. Oh, actually, you're here. I'm Leonie Kirby, and I'm from Sanborn Regional High School. And teachers need to be more aware of what's going on in their school and in the hallways. Teachers see things happening daily, and they don't do anything about it. It's not only cyberbullying, it's bullying in school as well, and kids get really upset over it and sometimes take actions that could have been prevented. Many things more need to be done to help protect kids in their school these days and not enough's being done about it. Hi, I'm Natalie Fabrizio and I'm a part of the Hampstead Middle School Anti-Bullying Committee. Our committee was founded because we had a presentation about a young boy who committed suicide over bullying and we wanted to make sure that younger students who weren't well, well enough prepared to hear that kind of thing learn about what bullying is and how to stop it, how to protect it. We go to different schools and we present our, we show them different forms of bullying, how they can stop it, different things that have happened and we just want to stop bullying in younger generations. I'm Kelly Bennett. I'm the student assistance counselor at Timberlane Regional Middle School. So I work with sixth, seventh, and eighth graders. And I am having this conversation every day. I'm at work. There are lots of kids. Um, and it doesn't matter what type of kid it is. They're experiencing these issues. And really, what we hope to do is just educate. You know, some of you mentioned the staff. Um, we're doing a lot of those efforts at our school this year and, and really getting our staff on board and, and acting, you know, responding to when they see situations. And we're also working with our students to come forward and say, I've seen this. I've seen this online. I've seen it on the bus. I don't like it. What can we do about it? So really to change some of that climate. So we've gathered some students with us um, who are trying to tackle those things. I'm Danielle Reynolds. I'm from Timberlane Middle School in the eighth grade, and I'm kind of here to um, inform some of the parents that want to know what the bullying online really is because it is going on, especially in school, because I see a lot of kids are getting upset about it, and we really just have to tackle it right now because I don't want to see it going on anymore and have other people upset about it. Well, thank you very much. Those who have questions, please pass them down to the right, and uh, if somebody has questions in their hand, please raise your hand, and we'll have somebody come by and pick them up. I would like to, if I could, just mention a couple of things. One, uh, I'm Rich Cram, as I was introduced earlier, and the Director of Family Mediation Juvenile Services in Atkinson, New Hampshire, right down the street. I work with a lot of your uh, youth also. Uh, they're sent to me for a variety of reasons, but sometimes because they have anger issues. Uh, sometimes that's a mixed, misdiagnosis, and they're not really there for anger issues. They're there acting out uh, because they're being bullied potentially at school. Uh, an anger management class is only a piece of what can take place and what, what will assist them in giving them certain tools in which to uh, work with uh, those situations. It's really important uh, that our agency works very closely with the school systems as well as with the anti-bullying. Uh, it's, I mean, it's good seeing these young people here today. and. Uh, and, and, and assisting all of us. But I, I like my first question, I guess, if I could just put out the first question, seeing there's other people that haven't come up with one yet, but I'm sure there's some out there. <laughs> so I, I will spark the conversation. And, and, and I'm, I'm curious and, and to ask the young, young folks, what can the administration do better that would assist you as, as youth in the school to make change. And, and, and I know sometimes one of the things I hear is I don't want to be a snitch. Uh, I don't want to be the one who turns somebody in. 
but the fallout, is, as, as we've recently seen with the death of this uh, young person down in Massachusetts, and this is throughout the United States, not just to Massachusetts or New Hampshire, what can the administration do? This is a great audience. This is a great opportunity. And, and I'll throw that out to either one of you three, three ladies, young ladies. Teachers should take note of what's going on in the hallways and in the classrooms, and they should tell the higher authorities what can what's going on in the hallways at school. Um, sometimes students are afraid to go up and tell a counselor or a teacher, and teachers see it happening, and sometimes it seems they don't go up and approach anyone about it. Teachers should be open and willing to helping the students, in which they do every day, but they don't always take this into consideration that they can help in other ways as well. Thank you, Leone. Any the other two, any ideas? She said it. Good, wrapped it up nice. <laughs> we have a question from the audience. Um, what do you say to those parents who encourage the children to react with violence or say things, uh, say that they were bullied? But basically, what I'm, what I'm understanding from this question is, you know, don't hit them, but, you know, if you're hit, you, you fight back. Um, how, do you, how do you address that? And, and, and I'm looking at Kelly, or would you want to? You, want, you, want, you, you have a response to that? Great. Um, well, violence is definitely not the way to retaliate. If someone punches you, you shouldn't just let them punch you, but someone, like bystanders, are definitely a big part in the bullying. If they don't say anything, it'll just get worse. The person being bullied is definitely afraid that they're going to be taken as weak or, like, just... Yeah, a weak person. And the bully is just going to keep going, noticing that the bullied is not like, caring in any way. So bystanders really need to step up, and they need to have a say in the entire situation. Thanks, Natalie. I also think that the parents need to step up. Um, you know, I wonder about if there's been communication with the school. What has that communication looked like? Do you know exactly what's going on? What, what are the monitoring situations? If the school has information, they will respond. I know our assistant principals work tirelessly on investigating things that are going on and holding students accountable. Um, but if you've got that message out there that just, well, if they start it, you go ahead and hit them, it'll be okay that student really needs to know they, it won't be okay. You know, there isn't permission for that violence, like you said. So we really need for the parents to send along that solidified message of this isn't okay, we need to be talking to people and, and keep going up that chain if you're not getting answers that you like as to how to address that. Because it happens all the time. I, I have families who call, things have been going on for months, but they haven't reached out. Um, students are sneaky. They're really good at, at doing this. And sometimes people are right there, and we don't see it. And so we really need that communication to let us know what's going on and if somebody is struggling. There is a lot of perception to the fact that, as we heard earlier, that the young people see the teachers right there while this is going on, and the teachers have so many other things that they're reacting to in one day. And, and I hear that's what you're referring to a little bit. And yes. I was just going to say one of the things that I learned in the process of writing this book and uh, Bill and, and talking and with people is that um, one of the myths about bullying is that if, if you just strike back, if you just hit them, it'll be okay that you got to show them that you're, you know, you're, you're up to the task and um, that really makes the victim a victim again in a way and, and fighting back. Sometimes these kids, and you know better than I do, the bullies may have some mental health issues and and fighting back puts the, the child in more danger than they already were in. And the other factor about bullying is even if kids are the same age, there's often an imbalance of power, a perceived imbalance of power. So, you know, that what we heard from, from kids is that they they did feel helpless, and it's not their fault that they feel helpless, and it's not their fault that they don't feel like they're in a position to stick up for themselves, whether it's physically or verbally. And we need to really appreciate that, that they are victims. Thank you. And if I could piggyback a question to Dr. Davey. Sometimes it's said that the, the, the victim isn't the only victim, and sometimes the perpetrator is also a victim. Can, can you speak to that a little bit? What we see and, and what we know through the literature is um, many of the, the perpetrators have been bullied themselves in, in younger years and then be, start to retaliate uh, or get 
angry, um, and that is their coping mechanism. It's not the appropriate me cope mechanism, mechanism, and they need to relearn how to appropriately um, deal with some of the emotions that they are dealing with. Um, and they need those skills, and that is what we do in our services, is really provide the skills. Um, we are looking at developing groups for um, uh, a variety of uh, kids that are involved in bullying, both the kids who are bullied and the kids that do, bull do the bullying. Um, but you're looking at two different types of skills that are needed um, so that they can cope and um, function well in school. I, I do think what happens in school is sometimes um, the children can perseverate on what they hear on a regular basis and over time what we see is their self-esteem decompensates um, and, and that sense of uh, uh, decreased sense of self really becomes more anger uh, down the road uh, and so we do need to deal with that piece. So both, both parties both, both individuals are potentially are in trouble at, at, at one time or another in their lives, right. and, uh, and both could use. Uh, and a lot of times we focus on the victim, and, but what I'm hearing is the victim could be both people. At, at some point, at yes. At some point. Yeah. Thank you. We, we had a question from the audience. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I, I just I tried to write it down and go beyond. So. Can I just say that a lot of the kids are cyberbullying, is it too that those are the kids that have been bullied and that's their safe way to bully back? Because they, they're not. You know, there is so much happening out there. You can't say one answer across the board. You just can't say it. So a lot of kids, I, I understand that a bully in online would not dare to bully in a classroom. And I'm just going to ask you folks, for the purposes of clarity, for the. Uh, if we could use the microphone, and uh, that would be great. Otherwise, I'll have to repeat the question. Just, just one other response to that, and, and you know, you make a, a great point. But one of the things that we haven't done is provide our kids with the skills to de-escalate a situation. And I think that they may go and do cyberbullying because that's they, that's all they know how to get back. You know that 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 thinking. But what we need to do as educators, and I'll, I'll, I'll you probably hear me say this all night: educate, educate, educate. We have two groups to educate. Two most important groups in our business, by the way, teachers and kids. And so we need to give our teachers those skills to be able to help perceive what's happening in the hallways. And we also have to help our kids know that when they're in those situations, what do I do? And it doesn't happen naturally. It's just not a natural instinct. For some kids it might be. You know, they might be just that way. But for a lot of kids, we have an obligation as parents and as family and as community and as educators to give them those skills. Dr. Davey. Um, another piece. I, I sit up here. I, I am a parent of a middle school child as well. Um, and several of us in the office were talking today, and this is a real situation where it's happening frequently. We deal with it with a lot of our children, our, our kids personally, but also kids in the community, our, our children's friends. It's really, a, there's a parental responsibility. And part of that is knowing how your child is using the cell phone and knowing where the computer's at and monitoring. It's very, very important to be doing that. There are parental controls that will help manage some of what's happening out there. The other piece is when you do apply the parental controls on the computer and on the cell phone, there's a lot of changes that will happen in your home. Your child will start speaking to you, not at the, the, the cell phone and stop texting so much. So really think about that. It's really important. There is, there is a personal uh, and parental peace to all of this as well. Thank you. I, question from the audience, and it might be better served to, to Ms. Bennett. Elementary, senior middle school, do we have this going on in elementary? And, and if so, how's it, how do you see it manifested? <laughs> do you speak with the elementary schools in the area before the kids come up to you and, and, and have an idea? Is there a transfer of knowledge from the elementary to you also? I can only speak on behalf of, of our district, Timberlane. We have actually taken a lot of steps this year to address um, bullying. We've um, 
been using the Elvaeus Bullying Prevention Program and doing some trainings throughout the year with staff on how exactly to intervene when you see a situation. I know there's a lot of well, that student, I don't know. You know, I'm not really sure what to do. So we've done that this year at our school, and we're talking about how do we work this down at the elementary school because I know it doesn't happen where you're a sixth grader and all of a sudden this is what's going on. There are some things that are, I have a lot of kids who are telling me stories about when I was in the fourth grade, when I was in the third grade, and sometimes they're still in the seventh grade carrying those instances. I mean, we all have a story about when we were harassed as a kid, you know, and some of us are a lot older and it's that powerful. So when our kids, I think, are getting it multiple ways from multiple avenues, you know, with the technology that's out there, um, we absolutely need it down at the elementary level when they can learn those skills about how to deal with this, who are their trusted adults, who can they go to, how are they talking with their parents, how are the parents responding back, absolutely. So I know for our district, we, you know, we have some plans maybe to address this at elementary because those kids need it, they, they absolutely do. Great, a lot of times I think we hear that Children are too young at that age, they're still just playing in the playgrounds and it's not an issue and, and they'll work it out. But I see we have uh, an expert witness here. So. Um, well, for the, our committee, we went to this Hampstead Central School and we talked to some of the kids and they were definitely talking about some, not major bullying issues, but they said that some kids, when they're young, they just make some comments and it really hurts another child. and they didn't know what to do about it, so we told them some things. But yeah, it definitely happens at elementary, and it just doesn't get worse, but it just gets more intense as you get older. I also know, that, and I don't know percentages, but I know a lot of the students at school have cell phones. They have access to the internet on their phones. They are on their phones constantly, all day long, in class, in the middle of the night, at five o'clock in the morning. So if you have somebody who has technology, um, they are old enough to be having these types of conversations and it should be monitored. And I, I would be absolutely okay with that. Interesting point and another question from the audience. How, many, how, many, how much time do you think uh, young ladies uh, at the, on the board is spent per day texting, emailing, cyber this, cyber that? Uh, just to, Danielle, what do you think? Honestly, probably days. They don't really get off the cell phone. They're always texting, always on the internet because now that internet is on your cell phone, you are allowed to go anywhere. Like while you're sleeping, you'll hear like this beeping noise and then your friend picks up their phone, they're texting away, it's like two in the morning. So honestly, all the time, days. All the time, and I think we have. No, 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 no. <laughs> Other than these young ladies. Well, yeah, we all text, it's like our, Second language, yeah. Um, but many kids think it's rude not to respond to a text message right away. So, because it's like if someone calls you, you really want to talk to them, you're not going to just ignore it. It's just, yeah. And then. That's fine. Would you like to piggyback on what she said? Kind of like what Danielle said, kids are always on their phone. They'll be in class texting, and even if the teacher takes their phone away, they get it back at the end of the day, and they'll do the same thing tomorrow or in two weeks from now. Um, and, like, the same thing always happens. Kids are at dinner, and they'll be texting, and it's basically what Danielle said. Kids are always on their phone. But I have to also add... Parents are also texting their kids during school. So this is one of the really huge issues that we have about how do we monitor the cell phones and somebody will say, well, you know, everybody needs to have them off or the school needs to take them. But parents are texting their kids throughout the day, which makes it really difficult because that's one of the barriers that we face, support from the parents about addressing the texting and the cell phone use that goes on. Interesting. Boy, the I want, I want to travel down this end of the table if I, I could. Do, I do have one thing to say. I think I, I foresee in the future um, that schools are probably going to end up getting some sort of cell phone blocking capability so that you can't use your cell phones at school anymore. I, I can see that happening. Uh, it's going to probably have to happen. And the other thing, 
the other thing is at home you know if your kids are texting during dinner you've got to lay down the rules honestly and have a no cell phone time you know have dinner make the kids have conversations at the table um, even if you're talking about the cell phone that's fine but you know um, parents have a lot of responsibility as well I think and you have to lay down the rules question from the audience Hi, I'm Deborah DeSimone, Atkinson. Whatever happened to rules? <laughs> Why don't we have rules in the schools that you're not allowed to have a phone when you walk in through the door? Simple, easy. If you have a phone, it's taken away from you, and your parents have to come to the school and pick it up. Whatever happened to rules? When I was in school, and when my children were in school, we weren't allowed to have food and drink in the classrooms. We weren't allowed to have toys. We were there to be educated, not talk to our friends, and not get calls from our parents. What can we do to make the rules and uphold those rules? Can anybody answer that? Probably not an easy question to answer, is it? <clears throat> you know, um, the cell phone use really became prevalent right after the Columbine incident. You know, there were parents that were thankful, and, and I don't have a position, I'm not trying to be, you know, opposed to what you're saying here, but parents were thankful, and in other school situations where there was unfortunate uh, violence from an intruder. Um, the, the, the research and the data that we received really indicated that parents felt safe when their youngsters had those cell phones. Quite frankly, those cell phones were used by the police. The kids were calling out. They knew exactly where the perpetrator or you know, the intruder was. So I, I think that's where it started. And, and parents feel safe. And as a former principal and as a superintendent, I know that many parents send their youngsters off to school so they know where they are, if there's an emergency that they can call them. And that's how it began. Now, my experience is, is that schools have rules around the use of cell phones. Um, we, they have rules around chewing gum. Uh, they have rules around running in the hallways, but there are youngsters who make choices that don't always follow the rules, and so the leadership, the, the, the administrators in the schools work very tirelessly to, to try to um, take control of those issues. So uh, I, I think I hear the kids saying that, you know, there's texting and um, during the class time, and, um, um, and, and I'm guilty. I, I called my son, and he was in a class at college, and he's more embarrassed that his mother called him than anything else. But, um, you know, uh, it, it is, it's become such a part of life with our, with our youngsters, the way they communicate. So there are rules. I, I, I don't think you'll talk to a systems leader that wouldn't tell you that there aren't rules in place uh, for the proper use of those uh, pieces of technology. That was exactly what I was going to say because I think the technology is here. It's here to stay. Our kids are going to use it. We need to know how they're using it and we need to be there to show them how to do it responsibly, and which is, which is what I'm concerned about. I don't mind that kids have the technology that they do, but I don't want somebody to be, you know, impacted lifelong where they may get to the point of suicide because of what's happening on that technology. That to me is where our issue lies about um, how they deal with the stuff that's going on and set some boundaries and limits for themselves on what they're going to participate in or not. Okay. As far as in enforcing the rules, I think um, teachers could probably take some lessons from flight attendants and start acting like them and making people shut off their phones. I mean, it's real simple. I mean, once they leave class, they can turn their phones back on to do texting or whatever. Um, it probably means uh, the teachers would have to keep an eye out more for kids, you know, doing it under the table or whatever, but start acting like a flight attendant and maybe not hand out peanuts, but, um, you know, just in making rules and saying, you know, if I see you texting, I'm going to take it away until the end of class, you know, and, and just start doing it that way if you have to. Now, we have, to, I know we're 
running low on time, and, and, and uh, we, I want to add a couple more questions. Uh, Tim, did you want to um, add something to that last thought? Yeah, I just wanted to piggyback a little bit on the, um, the use of, of technology in the classroom. I know at Timberlane, um, we're really working hard at, at least at the high school level, we're trying to integrate the technology into the classroom. Most kids have the, the smartphones or the cell phones or the I, iPhones or whatever, and there are ways to utilize that technology by coaching the kids and, and having uh, ways to, you know, interactive smart boards and all kinds of other ways to actually use it effectively. Um, but as, as Kelly says, we need to coach them on how to be responsible with it and not fight the tide necessarily. Um, and at least I think that's the direction at Timberlane that we seem to be moving in. Thank you. Question from the audience? Yeah. Uh, Dick Garish from uh, Kingston. Uh, <clears throat> it was mentioned before establishing, uh, creating some tools to help the administrators and also the teachers and, and students. Uh, which led me to think about the, the possibilities of uh, uh, trying to create a more positive peer pressure within the schools. Uh, obviously, obviously, that's one place where a lot of this has taken place. Um, and if, if there was something that, that <clears throat> could be done uh, at that level where the problem is occurring, it's, it's better than uh, in creating a law because there's a lot of laws and we know a lot of people don't obey the laws. Laws are very important. I'm not saying that, that the legislation that doesn't have a purpose, but the thing is you can have a law that doesn't mean that everybody is going to uh, obey it. But my, my thought is, is the, if each school, it may be the state or maybe the Department of Education, can uh, research and create and come up with a student's Bill of Rights. Um, you're being affected by bullying in school. Uh, so there are certain infringements being placed uh, on your life that is detrimental. So the thing is, if, if my feeling would be one way to create a positive peer pressure um, instrument. And I, I think it could be done at each school and the students could basically come up with that bill of rights that you expect all students to abide by in the best interests of the whole school. A thought. Many thoughts uh, going on tonight. I'm going to suggest that we have other forms that are coming up. They're listed in your handouts when you first came in. I encourage you to attend those forms. Uh, I do want to just ask a question of the representative. Uh, this new legislation. Is there, going to, is there uh, teeth in this legislation that will assist law enforcement, school administrators, uh, things, uh, things along those lines, to assist them in, in trying to curb the, the bullying, the cyber bullying, and things of that nature? Well, um, is this on? Yes. OK. Um, first, I just want to say that the purpose of the legislation isn't to make criminals out of students who are bullying. It really is to help schools set policies so that they know exactly how to react to the bullying that is not being responded to right now in a way that um, it improves the school environment. I mean, the, if, you, if you look at the law, going back to this gentleman's point, the first thing it says is that all pupils have a right to attend public schools that are safe, secure, and peaceful environments. So that sets the tone for the purpose of the law. It's really, and the teeth in the law is, is the development of the policies, is the training piece that um, Kathleen Murphy talked about before, the training within six months and the annual training, which again will get to your point about how do we train our pupils and our teachers to, to really make sure those environments are safe and peaceful and, and deal with the times that they aren't, that there are problems with bullying. So um, I think a lot of the teeth in the bill and the thing that will make it work is not the fact that we have a bill, but that we have mandated training and support for the people who are trying so hard in our schools to address this issue and so that pupils are trained. What do you do if you're a bystander? How do you react? What, you know, there are tools out there and we know a lot about what needs to be done. We just need to spend a lot more time doing it. Kelly, you know, I, just, follow up? I just want to add one more piece. I know um, 
We've been, we've been doing that training with our staff and it works because we've had an increase in student reports of things that they've seen. Now, I don't think that it's because, you know, our staff just doesn't care or anything that it wasn't happening before, but I think that we've been having a lot of conversation and conversation with the teachers translates into conversation with the students. It validates that it's not okay. This is how I want you to respond. This is where you can go, who you can go to, and what we'll do. And I think those are really clear messages for students and they want to hear that. Um, I think we need we need both parts. We need the policy. We need the practice. It's it's what has to happen for students to feel to feel safe. When you change that climate, is when you get that positive environment that we all want our kids to have. Tyler, you got a question? Uh, could you, sir? Sorry, sir. Couple more quick thoughts, and then we really do have to wrap up. I know we could be here all night long, and and I absolutely understand that. That's why I encourage you to come back to some of these other workshops. Uh, please, when you leave, drop off your green sheets, your surveys on the way out, and uh, we are going to have some closing thoughts. Um, Tyler Brennan for Timberlane. Uh, this is kind of off, to off topic, but um, back to the violence thing. I am not for violence, but yet I'm not against defending yourself if someone does pick on you. Um, I know from my experience that if a kid is getting picked on, he's going to stick up. He doesn't really feel it. Like the kids think that it's wrong to go tell a teacher because like it f they feel like they can't stick up for themselves, and if a kid finds out, then you're just gonna be picked on more. And I f feel that way. I felt that way before I got into the uh, the group, but now since I know that how much it can help, um, I do feel that it is better. Do you guys have any ideas on convincing any other kids to go with that way instead of? That way. Tough question. Great presentation. No? Thank you. Um, my name is Carrie Fortin. My daughter is on the panel. My son in the junior high was a victim of bullying. I encouraged him for the longest time to walk away, walk away, walk away. I reported it to the school. We went through numerous different things. This was years ago. And finally I got to the point where I had said to him, you need to defend yourself, not hurt yourself, not hurt anybody, but be able to safely get away. The other thing I want to say is <coughs> parents have a bigger responsibility. As far as the cell phones, the parents need these tools to say to the children, you know what? Texting in school, unacceptable. The other thing that I also want to touch upon was that if you give the teacher the skills, the tools, you also need to make the parents more aware of these tools so they can be more helpful. Thank you. All right, last. I just Go want to address what, what um, Tyler just said. Um, I'm the half, one of the health teachers in eighth grade at Timberlane, and I asked the original question about this because that is the feedback I get on a daily basis. Well, I'd hit him. If he's going to bully me, I'll hit him. I get it from boys, I get it from girls. It's not just, you know, a, a guy thing. <laughs> My suggestion to that, and, and the girls on the panel and, and the kids that are here, is that's where your bystanders come in. You know, we teachers miss a lot in the hallways, but kids hear it all. And, and I know it's tough for a kid to stand up. That's the only way the bullying is going to stop, is if that kid doesn't allow it to happen. And I'm not saying he's going to go up and bully the kid that's bullying, but to step up and say, why are you doing this, or leave my friend alone, or just show that it's happening. We've had more kids since we've started the bullying come to the administrators and let us know that it's happening since we've done it. But I think that it's up to you kids to stand up for your friends as well. Thank you. Last question from the audience. Can I she wants to respond. Oh, okay. Um, like you said, bullying um, bystanders are a big part. If a bystander doesn't say anything, they're just as much a bully as the bully that is mm -hmm. saying it. Yeah. Hi, my name is Dan Reynolds, and my daughter's on the panel. Um, <laughs> proud father. Um, I think if you're going to deal with a situation like that, you got to deal with a bully himself, and you know, in a in a passionate type way. In other words. You know, you're not going to go in there and be uh, 
super authoritative. You just go in and you try to understand why this person is doing it. I mean, there's an obvious reason because I, I think that you, you people must feel that um, maybe a repetitiveness, a bully may go through like seventh grade, eighth grade, ninth grade and have a career of bullying. And you're dealing with that same person over and over, elementary school, middle school, high school. I think it's a, uh, an issue where you have to pull this person aside. You have to say, do you really realize what you're doing? You know, you're hurting a person. Do you, would you like to be treated like this? This is not acceptable. And this is the kind of behavior that, uh, you know, it's just not good for you and it's not good for the people around you. And you really have to be passionate and very concerned and very, uh, you know, you have to think of that person too. And really uh, try to understand why he's doing it. And that's the only way that you're going to solve the problem is by dealing with the issue of the bully himself and resolve his issue and stop him from doing it. And that's, that's, if you can't do that, it's going to just keep on going. So I guess you're going to have to have somebody with some real understanding and um, you know, some real good skills to try to cope with what's going on with this person. Can, can I just mention that one of the things that's in the, the rewrite of the law that wasn't in the other one is that part of the policy is that a statement that there shall be disciplinary consequences or interventions or both for the pupil who commits an act of bullying, harassment, intimidation, or cyberbullying, or falsely accuses another of the same as a means of retaliation or reprisal or as a means of bullying, harassment, intimidation, and cyberbullying. So I just want you, I think that's a really excellent point, and, and there are great tools. I applaud the fact that you're using the Yelveus program. It's just internationally recognized as a very effective program and it's good to hear that it does work but but yes yeah, schools now do have to in fact have policies about dealing with it so uh, okay two this is one here for a response and then here and then we'll do you, can I have the young lady respond please first Yes. Um, back to the bystanding, kids are really like afraid to stand up for themselves. But if you do go to your guidance office, like and encourage kids and teens to go to the guidance and let them let the guidance department know what's going on, they can help and they can even do it anonymously and just let them know, let the school know what's going on so that they can look out and make sure that nothing bad really happens. Thank you. Closing thought from the audience. Um, just in regards to the bill, my. A lot of this addresses schools and the school's responsibility. I haven't had a chance to read it yet, but I hope there's something in here about parents' responsibility and parents, just like kids have a party at your house or you're responsible for... Um, yeah, uh, uh, your, your, point is, your point is well taken, but um, we're not allowed to legislate parent behavior. And so because we, we support public schools and, and, and charter schools were able to legislate for that for that institution. But unfortunately it's it we can't tell parents how to parent. Uh, uh, Dr. Davy, last thought of the night from the panel. But we can work with the parents and we do work with the parents and we try to pull the parents whenever possible and work with the family as an entire system. Different from um, the school districts, we can work, we work what's happening at home in the home environment. We work with the school, what's happening in the school environment. We can work with the coaches, we can work with any extracurricular, as long as we have permission for releases to work with, uh, from the parents to work with all these organizations. We can work collaboratively. We work with Timberlane on a regular basis uh, and many other schools in this area. Uh, so it's, it's really important to work as a team. Uh, and I, I think I, I think I'm I could say pretty proudly that we work very well with Timberlane um, in this district uh, in addressing some of these major concerns with the kids and the families. Thank you, Dr. Davy. With that, I would like to introduce back uh, Jennifer Selfridge, who who's been very uh, instrumental in putting this together along with the uh, rest of the coalition. And thank the uh, uh, distinguished board of. Uh, experts here as well as our keynote uh, Jane thank you for very insightful things and my last thought would be thank you the audience for taking part in this today and please spread the word and of what you've learned uh, to those around you and to your neighbors thank you well said thank you, thank you all very much um, this was a great discussion obviously 
Um, there are still lots of questions, and so I'm going to encourage those of you who are still here to talk with those who have already left and to meet us April 22nd. 22nd? 20th? April 20th? Somebody look on your thing, it's late for me. Um, in Raymond, where we're going to talk more in depth about cell phones. In Derry, where we're really going to explore legislation and what schools can do and what parents do and how the law enforcement fits into this puzzle. And then again in Exeter, when we really start looking at in depth at Twitter and Facebook and all of those new ones we learned about tonight from Jane. Thank you so much for coming. Thanks for doing such good things with your kids. And um, we will see you in Raymond on the 20th.